Sebastian. I will speak today uh, about a measure theoretic approach to negative probabilities. It will be a complementary talk to that of Acacio earlier today. I will first start uh, setting the mathematical background and the intuitions or concepts that are behind this mathematics. And then I will jump into some technicalities of the negative probability approach based on measure theory. So suppose that you have a probabilistic system. It could be an atom to fix ideas, but it could be any other thing that you are observing. And then you perform measurements. So this drawing here represents a particular type of measurement. Each measurement will have, or experiment that one performs will have outcomes. I draw only three of them here, but this is quite general. It could be any number of different outcomes. So these are, the outcomes of a particular experiment. But when one considers the set of outcomes, one can form an outcome set. And from an outcome set, one gets a Boolean algebra of events associated to that outcome set. And a probability will be nothing but a measure satisfying Kolmogorov's actions, as was explained in Jorge Hirsch's talk. Uh, the other day. So I will not go into the details because this was discussed several times in this conference, fortunately. But if you don't get any of this, you, you can, of the maths of this, you can think about it as a dice or a coin. So each empirical context, so each, each concrete experiment that you perform on a system, on a probabilistic system, will define a set of probabilities. And mathematically, we describe this using the notion of a measurable space, which consists of an outcome set, a Boolean algebra, and a measure. That behaves pretty much like uh, in measure theory, as it, if it were an area, as in Lebesgue. So sigma is a sigma algebra, but what is important for us is that it is a Boolean algebra. So the distributive laws hold. A random variable is nothing but a measurable function. If you don't have the mathematical details of a measurable function at hand, sim think simply about uh, an observable in classical physics, like the energy or, the, or any other quantity. But what it is important is that with this mathematical formalism, one has a well-defined probability theory that allows to compute mean values, and probabilities of any event in a rigorous way. So this is Kolmogorov theory. So each experiment gives place to a Kolmogorovian probability theory. But one can perform other experiments. I uh, represented this symbolically using another drawing. And th th there are many different types of experiments that we can perform on a, on a probabilistic system. Some of them can be performed together like this one and this one, but some of them cannot. So as it happens in quantum theory, we cannot measure uh, a spin of the system in two different directions at the same time. So some experiments are jointly measurable and other experiments are not. So what one ends up in a, in a sort of matrix like this, this means that on each uh, row of the matrix, we have experiments that can be performed together. So this one, these two can be performed together, these two can be performed together, and so on. But if one mixes elements from different columns, they cannot be performed together. This is the most general situation in any empirical probabilistic theory. Quantum mechanics is just a concrete example of this. So what is important for us is that for, for each pair or shortly measurable experiments, there exists a classical probability model. By that, I mean a Kolmogorovian probability that allows me to describe the combined experiment. But you don't have a global classical probability in order to describe all possible experiments. If you try to do that, you very quickly reach into uh, contradictions or things that might not happen in the world, like for example, as, as happens in, in the Bell inequalities. 
So I, I put this here with mathematics, right? This was with, with drawings, but now I put the same with mathematics. You have random variables on each row. And, and notice that some experiments, for example, this one here, the arrow can be performed with this one, but also with this one. But, there, but the same experiment, the same empirical procedure appears in two different contexts. That is one of the most important characteristics in quantum mechanics. There are experimental procedures that are the same, but in different contexts. So one can say that contexts or measurement contexts defined by rows, such as the ones I am showing you here, contexts are intertwined. Why? Because they share things. So, each experiment is described by a Kolmogorovian probability space, but also each row of the matrix. By that, I mean a collection of compatible random variables that can, whose, whose experiments can be performed together will have also associated a measurable space. For all the random variables, there might, be not, there, there might not exist a global classical probability distribution. But notice that these random variables, F11 and F14, are essentially the same because they have the same content and are defined by the same empirical procedure, but they should not be a priori identified because they belong to different contexts. And this is very important in statistics because uh, it might lead to, to, to problems if one don't have if you don't have that into account. So one has some observables that belong to different contexts. So what is the status of the observables that have the same content but belong to different contexts? Well, in principle, one could try to identify them, to put an equal sign between them. This is very usual in physics. Why? Because the marginals even if they belong to different contexts, the marginal are the same. Given that they are the same, you can identify them uh, and, and, and not having too much trouble. Notice that this is the, the no signal condition. The marginal probability for this uh, will not depend on the context. But some authors say that they are different because it, this is a, a natural assumption in a statistics, because if, if in, in general, uh, in a general probabilistic theory, this might be signal. So the, the marginals, the, the, the probabilities associated to this particular experiment could be different. Fortunately, it doesn't happen in quantum theory. With Acacio de Barros and Desio Krause, we propose to consider them as indistinguishable. And we, combine this notion with the mathematical formalism of quasi-set theory. But usually an identification takes place. So one, one, so one can see that contexts are intertwined. So C1 cannot be performed at the same time with C2. If one chooses to perform experiment C1, one cannot perform experiment C2. So a state, a quantum state, will give us a collection of classical probabilities, one for each context. But we know that contexts are intertwined. So we have quantum observables, maximally compatible quantum observables define context. So one has an injection here, a kind of embedding of Boolean algebras. This is a Boolean algebra, and this guy here is a Boolean algebra too. And for Boolean algebras, we have classical probabilities. For each observable, a classical probability, and for each context, a classical probability. But the thing is that given that contexts are intertwined, this is not the end of the story. So we know that there is a mathematical object that contains the information about all possible contexts. This is the lattice of projection operators of the Hilbert space. So a quantum state is not a classical probability, but it is, it is a measure on the non-Boolean lattice of projection operators acting on the Hilbert space. And the Gleason's theorem makes this, uh, this diagram commutative. Why? Well, in quantum mechanics, as I said, we have a global object. 
that contains the information about all the contexts and correlations. It is very useful in practice. If we would only stay in the classical description, it would be very difficult to deal with quantum phenomena. The, 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 great, the great step forward of quantum physics is to build a non-commutative probability calculus that allows us to give a unified description for all possible measurement contexts. And the story will not end up there because we know that there is more. The projections are elements of a ring of operators and due to Gleason's theorem, all this diagram commutes. So there are at least two ways of describing global states. An object like this, this guy here is a measure and this guy here is a density operator. But remember that they are the same because of Gleason's theorem. The first alternative is the one just described, to paste Boolean algebras and end up in a non-Boolean structure and define states as usual in quantum mechanics or in quantum logics. It's, one can speak about uh, orthomodular lattices or partial Boolean algebras. But the second alternative, and it is very important in physics, I, I will explain why in a minute, is to keep using Boolean algebras and create here a Boolean algebra, but allowing this measure to be negative. This is a, a move that is very important in quantum physics. Why negative probabilities are so important in physics? Well, they have a long tradition in the history of physics. Everyone knows the Wigner quasi-probability distribution and its applications. And Dirac also studied them in the context of energy, for example, he says negative energies and probabilities should not be considered as nonsense. They are well-defined concepts mathematically, like a negative money. And also Feynman tried to dig into the mysteries of negative probability. He says, trying to think of negative probabilities gave me a, cult a cultural shock at first. But when I finally go easy with the concept, I wrote myself a note so I wouldn't forget socks. So it, the lesson says, well, uh, th there's a video of Peter Shore explaining that uh, he attended to a lecture by Feynman and he was thinking that allowing negative probabilities would allow to understand the, ep the EPR paradox. And of course he was right uh, to a great extent. So, but the most important thing for us is that many relevant applications in quantum optics, quantum contextuality and quantum information theory rely on dealing with negative probabilities. So either if you like it or not, if you're a practicing physicist, it's very likely that you find yourself working on negative probabilities or trying to read a paper that deals with negative probabilities because they are a very useful practical tool. So now I will turn into a joint work with uh, Professor Acacio de Barrios from the San Francisco State University about negative probabilities. Let me explain the motivations first. We started to uh, work on contextuality and we were wondering what will be a general definition of negative probability. Of course, there are many in the literature, but we wonder whether it was possible to give a definition which is based solely on measure theory as in Kolmogorov's actions. Just we, we wanted the, the negative probability version of Kolmogorov theory. Is that possible? And importantly, we wanted it to be independent of any Hilbert space structure. So we don't want to rely in the quantum formalism. Another question was how to incorporate the notion of context from the very beginning. This is very important, the notion of contextuality. And the other question was to study connections between indistinguishability and negative probabilities. So the details can be found here in this publication. Uh, it's uh, from, from the last year. But now I'll give some, some idea of the definition and its technical properties. So the simple move will be, instead of using Kolmogorov's actions, to use just a sign measure, which is the same as Kolmogorov, but one allows uh, this measure to take negative values. Now we don't put evaluation into the zero one interval, but we allow all possible real numbers. This is, uh, so this triplet here will be called a sign measure space. But of course, there's a problem here because in quantum mechanics, we need contexts. Where are contexts in this 
definition. They are not included. So we need to find, we needed to find a definition that incorporates from the very beginning the, the possibility of having measurement contexts. So one, one way that we found was starting with the sign measure space, define the notion on a, of an extended random variable, which is the same, pretty the same uh, as a random variable, but now defined over the sign space. So now the pre-image of every open interval or every Borel set will be just a measurable set associated to this space, but the measure could be negative. Up to now, this is very usual, but now it comes the, the idea that I think that changes the setting because what we do is to consider a family, a collection of extended random variables defined on a family of signed probability models. What we say is that the general context will be a subset of this family. So a context will be a collection of random variables such that there exists a sub-sigma algebra of the algebra associated to this family of, of, of signed probability models in such a way that when the probabilities are restricted to this sub-sigma algebra, they are classical. So for all f, for all event in this sub-sigma algebra, this triangle becomes a classical probability space. And the, the random variables of that context are classical random variables with regard to that measurement context. So let me put now an example. Suppose that we have three random variables and the three of them are not compatible. So you cannot perform uh, an experiment in which the three of them are measured together. So they, you can measure X and Y, Y and Z and X and Z, but not the three of them at the same time. So what you have is for each pair, for example, X and Y, you will have a classical probability space. For Y and Z, a classical probability space uh, depicted here in red, and for X and Z, another classical probability space depicted in green. But the whole thing is embedded in a Boolean algebra, sigma. So this sigma one is a, is a sub-algebra of sigma, sigma two and sigma three, they are sub-algebras. And omega is the same. And this is done in such a way that when mu, the global measure, when restricted to the black circle here is a classical probability and coincides with P1. And the same move restricted to the red circle coincides with P3 and so on. But mu is not necessarily positive. It might take negative values. So this allows us to describe uh, negative probabilities. And surprisingly, it includes uh, many physical examples of interest, like the, the, the Bigner transform can be described in this way. But this way is not dependent on the Hilbert space formalism, of course, and also the bell inequalities and many other examples. So with this definition, we think that we capture the notion of contextuality, of having contexts that are not necessarily compatible between them, but with the global knowledge that might take uh, negative values. So <clears throat> a signed probability space, also called the negative probability, will be a signed measure space endowed with a non-empty set of contexts in the sense of the previous definition. The measure will be a signed probability or a negative probability. So this is, for example, what happens, I showed you here, for example, X and Y, how to build a, a Boolean algebra for the two of them. So this is how the Boolean algebra looks like. And, and the probability assigned to them will be a measure defined here as in measure theory. And of course, one can go on and add more variables, X, Y, Z, and create a Boolean algebra. So our algorithm, what it does is to compute first a global Boolean algebra for all the random variables, even if they are not compatible. But then in that 
global Boolean algebra, we define a measure which might take negative values. So how will that work for the three random variables? Well, one ends up in a family of equations. These are linear equations. The inputs are the mean values of the random variables. One has, for example, the, the mean values of single random variables. And here one must solve these equations for the piece. The piece are the probabilities associated to the elementary events. And one also can consider mean values of products of random variables and so on. Depending on how much information one inputs into this system, one might have one solution, many or none. It depends. But the thing is that one ends up in a linear system and using the input, one can solve this linear system and find all possible negative probabilities that are compatible with the input statistics. So this is how our general definition describes families of non-compatible random variables. But there's something important. In this definition, uh, we are usually, we're using measure theory. So there is no restriction to finite models. I am explaining things using a finitary model, but with dichotomic random variables, but this is not restricted to uh, finite uh, sets. So it, it, it is pretty much a single mode of theory. So you have a very nice measure theory going on. So I'm just about to end. So, uh, what are the advantages? Well, it, the advantages of this approach, it can be used to define contextuality measures. So by, this is done by quantifying how negative is your state. And it includes previous examples of non-signal models as particular cases. Negative probabilities never appear in experiments. Only concrete contexts represent what actually happens. And it is possible also to define an entropic measure in the usual way. So it is just the usual way in, 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 in quantum logic. You just take a sort of convex rooks on, on all, 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 all possible measurement contexts. So, and how will that be in the, in the value inequalities? Well, Jorge Hirsch was talking about this the other day, uh, not, not so explicit about negative probabilities, but he, he described how to build a hidden variable model for a, for a Bell type scenario. So if one proceeds that way, one ends in a Boolean algebra, as in Bell, and a classical probability. Well, of course, Bell stops because he cannot go on. He says, well, it, it doesn't exist. It leads to a contradiction. Of course, of course, because quantum mechanics cannot be described by the global classical probability measure. But if you allow for negative probabilities, and this was a clear intuition of Feynman, uh, so you, you, you can find a solution. You will get a lot of equations. These are linear equations. They look bad, but it's, it's very simple. And you find that actually a singlet state will be described by the negative, pro negative probability. So we have a general uh, universal framework for dealing uh, with negative probabilities that includes, uh, as far as we know, most example, examples of interest, and it is based on measure theory, a single mode of theory, but it is an extension that allows to describe contextual theories. So it seems to us that to understand contextuality is deeply related to understand how contexts are intertwined. But then how global states and event algebras emerge? The identification of random variables among different contexts seem to play a key role in their genesis. There seems to be an indistinguishably, indistinguishability principle at play. Why? Let me come back to this slide here. In order to build a global Boolean algebra, I have to assume that this random variable x is the same when I consider it in context y, x, y, and it's the same when I consider it when in, in context X set, and so on for Y and Z. That is very important. So I have to identify random variables that have the same content but belong to different and incompatible contexts. So we have discussed the general features of a measure theoretical approach for describing quantum states. And our approach mixes Boolean algebras 
and allows for negative probabilities. If you are interested in this approach, you can go to some of our previous papers, especially this one last year. And I thank you for your attention. That's all. Okay, thank you, Federico, for your talk. If there are questions, you can express it in the chat and I will give you the word. There is a question from Alison Tessin. Hi. So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, uh, thanks for the talk. And when, when you discuss uh, quantum predictions from this perspective, do you uh, take into account the spectrum of operators or you assume that, uh, that outcomes, uh, the value doesn't matter? Mm. Let me see if I understand your question. I'm just, when I speak about projection operators, I just speak about the usual thing that you do in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, observables are represented by self adjoint operators. In the finite dimensional mm -hmm. case, they are Hermitian. And of course, a, a particular subfamily of the Hermitian operators or self adjoint in the infinite dimensional case are the projection operators. So it turns, it turns out that these mathematical entities have a very precise structure with is that they form a lattice. They, they, they say, so with projected operators, uh, you mean the physical interpretation of what do you mean? Uh, no. Uh, if I understood it correct, you represent measurements as random variables, correct? Ah, yeah, and I understand. Now, now I see your question. Now I see. Now I see. But let, let me let me explain you something that might uh, make make it very clear. Look, let us start the other way around because I went from from the basics to the most complicated. But let's suppose that you assume quantum mechanics, standard quantum mechanics. Okay, so then you have a ring of operators. That's trivial, right? Okay, so now you have a density operator that keeps a. a, a probabilities for all for all all observables here right so yes uh, it turns out it turns out that if you restrict to elementary tests like yes no questions like for example is the photon inside this box or not so you you represent that by a projection operator but each context each context, so each time you have a family, a maximally uh, a maximal family of com compatible observables, if you look at the projection operators associated to that family, they form a Boolean algebra. Do you agree? Okay. So that's, yes. that's elementary. So then these are the Boolean algebras here in this drawing. But it, uh, th these Boolean algebras are subalgebras of an algebra which is non-Boolean. So each quantum state, when restricted to one of these Boolean algebras, defines a classical probability model. This is why you can perform experiments. Otherwise, you, you wouldn't be able to do nothing in a laboratory. <laughs> when you do experiment and, and you, don't, you just consider a family of compatible observables, you will have a classical probability. But the whole thing is not classical because there is no joint global probability distribution for all the possible contexts. But notice the move that we do here. This is standard physics. Like, like this, is, this, is, this is what every physicist do. But also physicists do this. <laughs> so you, what you can do is not to create the quantum logic. Don't do that. Don't, don't go into the ring of operators, but go into the Wigner transform. For example, when you, when you have the Wigner uh, function, you transform the observer and you have P and Q in the same space. You, ha you have a phase space and a negative probability in that space. So it's, it's another way of representing quantum mechanics and quantum states, which turns out to be equivalent. That's, that's, that's very interesting. So what we do here is to, uh, to, to get independent uh, we, we, we get independency of the Hilbert space formalism, and we give a general uh, measure theoretic definition of probability that allows contexts, but 
uh, allows also the probabilities to take negative values. And when you restrict to the well-known examples, you will get, uh, yes, the usual, uh, the, the, the Wigner distribution. That's the idea. OK. And can I ask you one more question? I don't know. Ask Sebastian. I don't know if we have time. Okay. Sebastian, this There are, there are uh, two more questions. So if you want. OK, I can wait. You, you can surely send me an email, Alison. No problem. We can, we can keep, keep, yes. Or we okay. can keep uh, discussing after that one. Uh, yes, yes. Sure. There Thank is you. A question from Gerardo. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Federico, for the talk. Uh, I every time I, I hear you again, I understand a little bit more of the the, the kind of proposal that you have in mind. Um, okay, so I, I was just curious if we can go back to the last part of your talk where where you were uh, making uh, reference to to Bell's uh, theorem and the problem with how he. Uh, assumed uh, how the distributions uh, worked. So, so uh, here's the thing. Uh, uh, you attribute the problem to the idea that he is somehow uh, assuming uh, classical probability, right? But oh, that is, it's one of the problems. There, there are many problems, right? Ah, and okay. One of them so, is that so, he assumes classical probabilities. Yes. Oh, it's well, not a problem. It's an assumption. It's, yes, it's not a well, problem. Well, perhaps. The, Perhaps that's the, 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 the answer to my question. But, but my question was this. Um, um, it seems that what you're denying basically is the idea that you can have the same distribution over the lambdas uh, irrespectively of how, you, how Bob and Alice uh, measure. Is that correct? You are uh, basically denying the assumption of settings independence. Well, no, because if you allow them to be negative, <laughs> You can have the same. <laughs> you see what I mean? That, that's uh, too what I'm saying, <laughs> right? Okay. I'm saying that, I'm telling I'm you that one of the key assumptions, okay. and this was this was uh, well, this was even uh, you, you can you can look it uh, on YouTube, for example. It's it's very nice how Peter Shore tells about it. Tells this. He he says that he attended two lectures by Feynman, <laughs> and Feynman said that. I mean, one of the main problems is that you are assuming a classical probability. And there are many ways of assuming a classical probability. I mean, there are many, per, sorry, there are many different ways of not having a classical probability. So Bell assumes a classical probability, correct. So one might say, well, what, what, what are the assumptions that are wrong? One, one possibility could be, well, the world is non-local. As in, I mean, some people believe that there are hidden variables and that the world is non-local. Uh, so it, it's a it's a it's a very good uh, reasoning. It might be, but it might be that using uh, positive probabilities is not is not the best. Why? Why? I mean, what justifies Kolmogorov's actions? That's that's a very deep discussion, not in quantum physics, in the foundations of probability theory, and it it was never easy at all. What are, what are the right rules for probability? So so. It is presented sometimes as a as a mild assumption, but it, it, if you know about this, it is not. <laughs> I, I think it is not. I mean, you cannot present it as a mild assumption. That's what I think. So one way to play is to go into negative probabilities. Of course, some other people will say, no, not go into negative. Just use a non-commutative probability theory. That could be yeah. also. OK. Perhaps we can talk in another moment, but my suspicion is going to be that in the end, what is really happening, what is really, really, really the, the cause of the problem is the idea that you are writing the, the, the distribution of lambda independently of the settings of A and B. No, of but, course, but, yes, but well, that, that's one of the things, right? In, in yes, but, uh, but you can, what I'm telling you is that you can do that. You can actually do that and allow the probabilities to be negative, and then you will not derive the inequalities. Oh, but uh, the thing is that you don't need to talk about negative probabilities. You can stop with saying that the, the, the distribution of lambda depends on, on what is going to be measured by Alice and Bob, and you can stop the, the theorem. The theorem doesn't go. Yeah, I know. Oh. They, that, no. yeah. That's, ah, the, okay. that's the usual way to deal with the problem, right? That will say, I mean, an orthodox quantum physics will say, well, it's not the classical yeah. probability calculus. Stop 
assigning values to things that are not measured, stop mixing results from different contexts and assigning global, global probabilities because this is what we know from the very beginning of quantum mechanics. Which, if you don't that's say anything it. else, that is a mystery, right? Because it is well, a that's another, Why would you okay, say that's that? another discussion, yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. It's another okay. discussion, yeah. Okay. Wait some minutes for the last question from Dennis Dix. Thank you, Federico. I found that a very interesting, even exciting uh, talk. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit old fashioned and uh, I'm still shocked by the negative probabilities. So I can understand that you have a mathematical scheme here in which the negative values of the measure occur. And that, uh, that makes it possible to combine all these different uh, contexts. But I would, I myself would object to using the word probability for the negative measures uh, if, if you combine these contexts. Because probabilities have the, have I have two interpret main interpretations. One is relative frequencies, and the other is a measure of belief, the, the credence you can attach to a certain proposition. And, uh, and neither of them applies to this negative probability. So it, in, in my opinion, these negative probabilities do not qualify as probabilities. They are just mathematical quantities that are signed measures. I, I, I agree with that. But I, I feel, and that uh, links to the, to the comment you made on one of the previous uh, questions, I, I think there are very good reasons for the common core of axioms. And especially for the for the axiom that the probability should be between uh, zero and uh, and one. So, so to, to to cut things short, my question is: Why do you insist on uh, on uh, calling these negative values probabilities? If for me, it's it's obvious they are not probabilities. <laughs> now, okay, good question. Th thanks, thanks, Dennis. No, no, let me clarify things because. There are, there are several problems here. One is the interpretation of negative probabilities, which of course, of course in, is problematic. In this case, it's not so problematic because we don't claim that you will measure negative probabilities. We'll, we, you will never ever measure a negative probability. That's nonsense, you will not. What you will have is contexts. You have a very clear here in this definition, a very clear mathematical definition in the sense of Kolmogorov, of, 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 of measurement contexts. This is independent of quantum theory. That's what I, why I like this. So on each measurement context, you will have classical probability, and that's what you observe in the laboratory. But at the same time, it is reasonable to call, you can call it instead of negative probability or sign probability, or I don't know, you, you can call it, the, the way you want. The interesting point is that this is a natural, mathematically, is a very natural extension of Kolmogorov theory that incorporates the notion of context from the very beginning as a mathematical concept. That is very important for me. And let me tell you why. Uh, you know that uh, negative probabilities, even if you don't want to uh, use them as a, as a nice interpretation, they are very useful in, in, in quantum optics. I mean, you you end up dealing either way or, or the other with negative probabilities in physics, especially in quantum information. And especially if you want to study contextuality, because usually you want to look at the properties of quantum states. And one way of studying contextuality is to look at the Wigner distribution and see how negative it is with regard to a family of observables, for example, or for example, classicality. If you want to study if your system reaches the classical limit or not, a, a, a very usual tool is to look at the, how, how negative is the, the, the Wigner distribution. So we think that with this definition, we can give a, a, other definitions of contextuality that can be useful in practice to understand better, for example, why uh, quantum computers have a speed up. That's what we, now we are uh, working with uh, Elisa Monchietti. She's, uh, she's uh, starting her master thesis and we try to apply these mathematical tools to uh, study problems in quantum information. That's the goal. And it is very difficult to, to escape of, from that because 
You cannot tell a, a guy from quantum optics, no, don't use, don't use quasi probabilities. Don't use the Wigner distribution. No, I mean, people will will continue using it. Even I mean, uh, so so with this work, we are not claiming that you should replace standard quantum probability by negative probability. No. So, but we think that this approach uh, will give us at the technical level clues to understand better uh, quantum contextuality. That's what we think. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Federico, for your talk, and thank you for the people who participate making questions and comments.